This book, what we call the Bible, that I hope all of you have with you this morning, is God's Word. And you know, it was given to us, maybe I should say it was given by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to about 40 different authors over a period of some 1,500 years. When you look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, what the author says there is that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. He says it pierces even as far as the division of soul and spirit of joint and marrow. He said it's able to discern the thoughts and the intent of the heart. That's this Word. That's what it can do in our lives. Matthew refers to it as the gospel of the kingdom because it's filled with good news, what Jesus went about preaching. If you look at Mark or if you look at Paul, what Mark says and what Paul also say is that it is the gospel of God. And then if you go to Paul's letter to the church at Rome, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And he tells us why. Because he says it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. But what does that word gospel mean? You hear it all the time. We talk about gospel meetings. We talk about preaching the gospel. And we speak about the gospel. But what does it mean? The word gospel originally it comes out of the Greek language, but it was originally a reward that was given to someone because they were proclaiming good tidings. And eventually the word came to mean the good tidings themselves, especially that good tiding of victory when an army had gone to war. Later it was simply applied to messages of joy. Do you realize that that word is found 75 times in your New Testament? The word gospel is there 75 times, so it must be important. God would not have put it there through his inspiration so many times if it weren't. It's there because it speaks about the good news that God brings to us of salvation through his son Jesus Christ. And it speaks of a salvation that God has made available to all of us if we will be obedient to that. But the gospel is good news. And I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't like to hear good news. Let a baby be born and what's happening? Somebody's going to be sharing the good news. Parents love to say, oh, I've got a baby. They love to tell you all about it. Grandparents love to show you the pictures because we're excited about that new birth and an addition to the family. Don't we rejoice when someone makes an announcement that prayers have been answered and someone is, that was sick is now well? And don't we love to hear good news of someone that has obeyed the gospel? We love good news, don't we? But you know, with good news, there's also always bad news. And sometimes people who have both may come to you and say, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Which would you rather hear first? And you have to make the decision. Do I want to hear the bad news, start out with it, and then go ahead and build me up on the end with the good news? Or do I want to be built up by the good news before you tear me down with the bad news? Well, this morning, I want to start with the bad news because I think it will cause us to appreciate the good news that much more. And the bad news is this. All of us are sinners. Every one of us. We're sinners. 
You open up that book of Romans, that letter that Paul writes again, and you read the first two chapters, and what Paul is saying is he's talking about how God has revealed himself, and then he talks about how some have denied the revelation of God, and they've kind of turned to their own things. And then in chapter 2, he even adds to it, first it's the Gentiles, then it's the Jews, and finally in chapter 3, he quotes from a psalm of David. That psalm is actually found two places in the psalms. Do you realize that Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 are the same psalm? David starts out the same way in both of them. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But then Paul quotes from that and puts it in his letter in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. And here is what he says concerning our sin. He says, there is none righteous, not even one. He said, there's none who understands, there's none who seeks God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless and there is none who does good, not even one. A few verses later in chapter 3, he speaks those words that you've heard quoted over and over again. Verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means every one of us. We fall short of the glory of God. Every accountable person in this world who is living now or who has ever lived has sinned. And every, even the best of us, even the very best of us, here today is without merit in God's sight. We can't stand before God and say, God, here's all the good I've done. I think you should let me in. No, it doesn't really, it doesn't work that way, folks. You see, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul there in chapter 2 describes our predicament before Christ came on the scene because he speaks to us who are Gentiles, and I think all of us in this room this morning would be classified as Gentiles unless we have some Jewish ancestors in our background but he says in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 2 that you were dead in your trespasses and sins he said you were dead you go down to verse 12 and he says something else at the end of verse 12 he says that you were without hope and without God in this world so you're dead in your trespasses and sins you have no hope and you're without God I can't think of a a worse place to be in my life than to be a person who has no hope in this world and a person who's without God. But that's not all of the bad news. It's what that sin has done in our lives as far as our relationship with God. Some 700 years before Jesus Christ ever came upon the scene, he sent a prophet, a man by the name of Isaiah, to speak to his people in Judah. And one of the things that Isaiah said, because they were thinking that God wasn't hearing them. God wasn't responding to them in the way that he had done in the past. And so Isaiah says, the reason God's not responding to you is it's not, he's not reaching out to save you because his arm is so short that he can't do it. It's that he doesn't have power. And it isn't because God just can't hear you because his ears are too dull. No. The reason that God doesn't save you and that God isn't acting on your behalf is what he tells them there in Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2. He says basically you've alienated God because of your sin. Or the way he puts it is this. He says, but your iniquities, he says, have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And then if you'll come back to Romans with me and go over three more chapters, Romans chapter 6, Paul kind of draws it to his own conclusion and he tells us this, that our sin has a certain wage. It not only alienates us from God, he says ultimately it is death. The wages of sin is death. So what is it? What's the bad news? The bad news is that through our transgressions, through our sins, we have lost that precious relationship that we desire with God. And, and we experience spiritual death or this separation from God. And if we do not do something about it, if we leave it unchecked, ultimately it is going to result in our eternal separation from God, our torment in hell. Folks, that's the bad news. Now let me tell you the good news. The good news starts with this. God loves every single one of you in this room, everyone who will watch this or hear this later today, God loves you. As a matter of fact, you've heard this over and over again. We quote it. We, we know it. You know, 
Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and they have this conversation and then John records Jesus saying to Nicodemus that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. What does he say? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Or this same John who writes this gospel would later write three letters and then that final book that we know as Revelation. In his first epistle, 1 John, there in chapter 4, if you look down in that passage in verse 10, here's something else that John says. He said, in this is love, not that we love God, but he said, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the atoning sacrifice for us. As a matter of fact, because God is love, He decided to save us before He ever created this earth. Did you know that? He decided to save us before He ever created what we see around us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 He chose us, Paul says, in Christ or in Him before the foundation of the world. Before He ever created, He chose to save us. So here's the first part of the good news. God is love. And because God is love, and because He loves us, and because He doesn't want us to be lost, He sent His Son to save us. But who is this individual that He sent into the world to save us? Scripture tells us a great deal about him. And one of the things we know is that Jesus, the one who came and died for us, shared the Father's glory before he ever came to this earth. Not only that, he is the one that Paul called the Lord of glory. He is the one who existed before any of this existed, before the world existed, because what John writes in in his gospel there in John chapter 1 is this in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God he existed before any of this did and he is the one who created it because if you look at the very next verse John chapter 1 verse 3 here's what John writes all things came into being through him and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being and he he existed before he is, his glory was as of that of the Father. He is the one who created everything we see, and He is the one who is God. And you know the beautiful thing about all of that when you think about God sending Him to save us? Parents, have you ever sent one of your children out to do a chore or fulfill a task? And as they walked out the door, they slammed the door behind them and they kicked and they screamed and they fussed and they complained because they didn't want to do it. Do you realize that the Son of God came into this world to save us and He didn't come into this world kicking or screaming or complaining or acting resentful because of the assignment that had been given Him. He knew He was coming to this world to die. He knew that he would have to suffer at the hands of sinful men so that he could save us. And yet the one who came into this world to save us, although he was equal with God, the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says that he was or is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. This individual who was in very nature with God did not consider his equality with God something that he had to hold on to, Paul tells us in, in Philippians 2. But he says he emptied himself and he made himself nothing. He took upon himself the very form of a servant and was found in the likeness of men or in the fashion of men. On the night of his birth, there were some shepherds tending their flocks outside the city of Bethlehem in the fields outside of the city where he was born. And suddenly there was an angel that appeared to them, an angel of the Lord. And you can imagine they were terrified. That's what we're told by Luke. And yet the angel says to them this, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. 
And then he tells them what that news is. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Folks, that's good news. But we have to tell it. We have to share it. This Son of God, this individual, this one who was in, in, in the very nature God, who had God's glory, came to this earth and he went about doing good. The passage that Don read for you just a moment ago actually comes from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It was a prophecy made by Isaiah about what Jesus would do. And if you'll notice there, if you read the verses, the two verses just before where Don began reading, you'll notice he came to his hometown synagogue. And they hand him the scroll and he rolls it out to the prophet Isaiah and he reads this. And after he hands it back to them, he talks about proclaiming the gospel to the poor. And then he sits down and he tells them, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they're all looking at him. Well, what does he do? He goes about doing exactly what Isaiah said he was going to do. He goes about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This Son of God made flesh is the one who feeds the hungry, who gives sight to the blind, who causes the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the lepers are cleansed, he raises the dead, he's the one who is casting out demons. And the question I have for you is why did he keep reaching out to all of these people who were suffering from all of these afflictions? It is because of who he is. He's God in the flesh and what is God God declared himself to the children of Israel as a God who is full of compassion and loving kindness or mercy and that's what Jesus was demonstrating this is what God does because he loves those who are his and he came to save them he came to seek those who were lost but perhaps one of the saddest things that we read in all of this good news is what Paul says to us is the very central part of the gospel. And that is that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he arose from the dead on the third day. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul uses that part of his letter to defend the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to tell us that if Jesus never rose from the dead, then our faith is in vain, that we are of all people most to be pitied. But what he drives home is the content of that gospel. If you'll notice verse 3, here's what he said. Three things make it up, the gospel that is. Christ died for our sins according to the gospel. He was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now the question is, why is this good news? Have you ever stopped to think about why is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of this man good news? Here's why. A good man going about doing good and teaching us how to live did not solve our most basic problem. Sin. No. The only way that problem could be solved was there had to be a sacrifice made to take away that sin. That's why John declared him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He had to die for our sin. And he was buried. But here's the second part of that. It can't be good news if he stayed in the tomb. Because you see, a dead body does us no good at all here today. Because if Jesus is still dead, if the body of Jesus is still somewhere hidden away, having been stolen by his disciples as the accusation was made so long ago, it does us no good. No, we need somebody who rose up from the dead and who was victorious over the grave because otherwise Satan wins. So that's why he died. That's why he was buried. That's why he arose from the grave. And that's why we proclaim it in our songs that we sing. We sing words like these. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living, whatever man may say. Or this one, you've heard it. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior. He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. 
up from the grave. He arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Folks, this is good news. How can we not share it with other people? How can we not go around telling others, let me tell you something that you need to know. But because he's ascended back to heaven, there's some more good news. Because you see, he's seated at the right hand of his father. As a matter of fact, if you go to Mark's gospel after Jesus has given them directions and told them to go and preach the gospel, there in verse 19 of Mark 16, Mark says that when Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, here's what this writer says. He, the Hebrew writer declares to us that Jesus is our great high priest. And then having said that, he says, who has taken his hand or his seat at the right hand of the majesty or the throne of the majesty in the heavens. He is there at the right hand of his Father serving as our advocate. And because of that, you and I are encouraged to go boldly, to draw with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Folks, that's good news. I dare say, unless you've got a lot of connections I don't know about, there's not a single one of you this morning that can pick up your telephone and call the President of the United States. But you can bow your head right now and have direct contact with the Father, the God of all glory, the Creator of all that we see around us, because He hears you and He knows your very thoughts even as you sit here. You don't have that kind of access to anybody of power anywhere else and folks you have access to the one who all has all power and you have it because he who came and died and brought salvation to you and me is now at the father's right hand but I want to say this to you once you respond to his call that he extends to you through the gospel do you realize that your life your life will never be the same again it won't. Here's why. Because once you put Christ on in baptism, according to what Paul says in Galatians 3, once you are buried with him in baptism, you become a child of God. And because you're his, I love what Paul says in, in, in Philippians chapter 2, it is God who begins to work out in you that salvation he is working within you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 verse 5 is that God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us so God has a goal for us now because God has saved us and brought us into his own family and transferred us from the kingdom of darkness in the kingdom of his beloved son he has a goal that he seeks to achieve in each of our lives. And that is he wants us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. His goal is that we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we might be able to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, as he says in Romans 12 and verse 2. His goal is that we might now walk as children of light, as Paul would say in Ephesians 5 and verse 8. His goal is that we would be conformed to the image of his dear Son. And in 2 Corinthians, and I've used this a few weeks ago on a Sunday night. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul draws from Old Testament teaching. You have to go back to understand what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 3. You have to go back to what happened with Moses and the children of Israel and God in the wilderness. Because in Exodus chapter 34, there in verses 34 and verse 35, you can read around that, but here's basically what took place. In those days, God would meet with or excuse me, with Moses face to face. 
Now, Moses was never allowed to see the full glory of God. Moses was never allowed to see the face of God, but he experienced some of God's glory in what was called the tent of meeting. And he would go there and God would communicate to him and tell him what he wanted the, the people to know and then Moses would come out of that tent. And when he came out of the tent, his face would shine. And he would communicate with the elders of the people what God wanted them to do. And then after doing that, he would put a veil over his face to hide that glory or that, that, that shine until it finally kind of dissipated away. That's the way I understand it anyway. And so Paul draws from that. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, here's what he says. He says that we all, all of us who are Christians, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. What I understand him to be saying is that if you're a child of God, as you are continually exposed to the glory of God that he presents to us through his holy word, there is a transformation that God is bringing about in your life. He is bringing his glory into greater focus in your life. Folks, that's good news. I don't know anybody else on the face of the earth that has all of that given to them. So the question for all of us this morning is this. What will you do with this good news? What will you do with it? First of all, what will you do in your own life? Will you apply this news to your own life? Do you realize what the God of heaven has done for you? Do you realize that he has poured out and made available to you the riches of his glory? My plea to you, if you're a child of God today, is please don't discard these riches like unwanted mail. Don't just throw it away. Because you're throwing away life eternal. And if you're not a child of God, and even if you are a child of God, my question is, will you share this with someone else that you care about? Will you take this good news and say, listen, I want you to hear about what God is doing? Because that's what the early church did. They went everywhere. They went everywhere preaching the good news. So my plea to you is if you're a child of God this morning is don't be silent. Don't just tuck it away. Don't go home and put your Bible on the shelf until the next time that you come here. No. Share that good news. Tell somebody else about Jehovah's mighty son. Let them know salvation can be theirs. This morning, is salvation yours? Are you a child of the King? Have you been buried with Him in baptism so that the blood of Christ can take away your sin? Do you know what it's like to experience the riches of His glory that's been poured out to the saints? Because you see, everything that God gives to us is in Christ. It's through Christ. It's because of Christ. And apart from Christ, we have nothing. We are without hope and without God. Please don't leave here this morning not having given your life in obedient faith. As we stand to sing, will you come?